Hosea chapter 1. Just uh, two minutes on the context here, because we're just jumping into a new book. We're going to be in Hosea for uh, about 12 weeks. A couple things to give you the, the context here of, of Hosea. Uh, number one, uh, Hosea is primarily, he's in the 8th century B.C., so 750, 40, 30 years before Christ. He, he, he ministers for many decades, many different leaders, kings. He is in the north. Remember, the north and south split after Solomon's death, Rehoboam and Jeroboam. We talked about that. That was in 931, 932 B.C. Remember, the north, Hosea is prophesying to the north. If you read your Bible, Amos and Jonah are also uh, prophets in the northern area that are contemporary with Hosea. In the south, the area of Judah, the, the tribe of Judah, in the south, contemporary uh, prophets of Hosea would be Micah and, and Isaiah. So Micah and Isaiah. Isaiah is a big book. About the same time as Hosea, to give you some context here. Hosea is going to be prophesying or working, ministering, whatever it might, you might call it, from you know, maybe 750, 760 B.C. all the way back to about 716 or so B.C. So a long period of, of his ministry. It's interesting to note, we'll come back to this in the text, within a generation of some of these prophecies, uh, Israel, the people he's prophesying to, will be extinct. The Assyrians will come in and demolish them. That happens in his lifetime. And so the prophecies, the warnings, are there for a reason. So within a generation. Finally, two more thoughts. Hosea is very poetic. So a lot of poetry, a lot of symbolism, a lot of imagery with animals and nature. Uh, And second of all, he also knows the writings of Moses very well. So there's a lot of references to the Torah. And you'll see people like Jeremiah, the later prophet, a century and a half later, Jeremiah will pick up on some of the themes of Hosea. So Jeremiah follows Hosea's lead. Last thought, this gives you some context here for the the culture uh, and the people that Hosea is prophesying to. We talk about problems in our culture with government and politics. We don't talk about it on Sunday. But if you look at what Hosea was dealing with, it is astronomically worse than anything we deal with. And here's what I mean by that. I wrote it down last night because I thought this was helpful. From one comment, from one uh, scholar, during the life of Hosea, almost all the kings died by assassination. And so I made a little list here of some of these kings uh, about the political instability. Jeroboam II dies in about 753 B.C. The next king is Zechariah. He is killed very quickly after that, assassinated by someone working with him. A guy by the name of Shalom. Shalom kills him, takes the throne. A month later, Shalom dies, assassination. And um, another king takes the place. Uh, Nankem takes the place. The next king is Pekaniah. He is killed after two years. He's assassinated by a man named King Pekah. P-E-K-A-H. King Pekah is then assassinated. That's the culture, that's the context of Hosea. Uh, Not a long reign like David or a long reign like Solomon. It is political instability. It is assassinations. It's upheaval. Israel is tottering. Okay, It's the 1960s on steroids. It's a lot worse than anything that we experience politically, the ups and downs. Leaders are getting killed right and left um, in Israel. So that's kind of the context. I think that's hopefully helpful to understand when we go to Hosea. Hosea is not giving a self-help therapeutic... um, Prophecies. So it, it, Hosea does wake us up a little bit. That's why. You need to know the context of what he's writing about. So Hosea chapter 1. This is um, middle of the 8th century uh, B.C. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Beri, in the days of Uzziah, and Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and then in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take yourself a wife of whoredom, and have children of whoredom. For the land, the people, commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Deblame, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel. For in just a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. She conceived again and bore a daughter, and the Lord said to him, Call her name, No Mercy, for I will have no more mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all, but I will have mercy on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God, and I will not save them by bow, or by sword, or by war, or by horses, or by horsemen. When she had weaned, No Mercy, she conceived and bore a son, and the Lord said, Call his name, 
not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. And the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together, and they shall appoint for themselves one head, and they shall go up from the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for uh, speaking to and through the prophet Hosea so many centuries ago. And Lord, speak to us through your Holy Spirit to show us that this is not a message just for uh, the 8th century B.C., but this is for the 21st century as well. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, years ago, there was a, a group of concerned citizens, a group of very active, reform-minded citizens who met with their mayor. They met with their mayor because it was a pressing problem in their city that they wanted the mayor to address. It's a true story. They wanted the mayor to address this. And the city was Toledo, Ohio. And they went to talk to the mayor of Toledo, Ohio. His name was Sam Jones. And he was a reform-minded mayor in Ohio. His nickname was Golden Rule Jones. You know, the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Sam Golden Rule Jones. And so they, they came without telling him. They, all these concerned citizens came to his office to discuss, to discuss a growing problem in the city of Toledo, Ohio. There's a problem there. This problem is hurting the community. It's harming society. It's hindering the growth and the flourishing of the town. And the mayor said, well, what's, what's the problem? These citizens said, the problem is prostitution. There's so much of it in Toledo, Ohio. The town has too many women working at night, too many prostitutes. And these women are ruining the morals of the town. They're corrupting the men of the town. They're destroying the moral fabric of the city of Toledo, Ohio. We need to do something. And so these angry, upset, concerned citizens said to the mayor, Mayor Jones, you need to force all these prostitutes to leave Toledo, get, kick them out, send them away. They're harming, they're hurting our town. Kick them out. A very emotional plan, but maybe not a well-thought-out plan for social reform in Toledo, Ohio. And so the mayor said, okay, well, where should I kick them out to? Where are they, they going to go? We're we going to kick them out to Detroit? We send them to Cleveland? Where, where, do, where do these women go? They, they have to be sent somewhere. We, what are we going to do? What's the plan? It didn't really get a response from the concerned citizens. They just said, you just got to do your job and kick them out. Then the mayor looked at the group in his office, there at the town hall office, and he said the following. This is a quote from what he said to them. He said to these concerned citizens, he says, I'll make you a proposition. You go and select two of the worst of these women you can find, and I'll agree to take them into my house and provide for them until they can find some other home and some other way to provide for themselves. And then each of you take one girl into your home, and under the same conditions together, we'll try to find homes for the rest. The mayor said, get the two worst women, we'll provide for them in our house until we can find a way for them to survive and teach them something that they can, they can survive on. But each of you have to take a woman as well and provide for them in your own house. How do you think the rest of that meeting went? Do you think that meeting continued after that? It didn't. The meeting was over. There's nothing left to say to the mayor. The people wanted changes, but they didn't want that kind of change. That gets a little messy if we have to actually do it. Nobody wanted to take a prostitute into their home for even a few weeks. Nobody. Hosea 1 is remarkable because the Lord tells Hosea the prophet not to take a prostitute into his house for a few weeks, but he says, I want you to take a prostitute into your home for a lifetime. That's that's a startling, offensive message. I want you to take a woman without respect, but with a reputation into your home to be your wife for a lifetime. It's hard to know how Hosea felt about that first message from the Lord. Uh, I imagine he was as uncomfortable as we might be. 
he was probably as uncomfortable as those concerned citizens in Toledo, Ohio, a century ago. I imagine Hosea probably said something like, God, you, you want me to do what? I've got to do with her? That's what you want me to do. It's an offensive plan. It's outrageous. But it's God's plan for Hosea. And so we're going to look at our story here in a little bit of detail and, and show us what it teaches us about sin and grace in Hosea chapter 1. So as we look at Hosea, his name, it's the same root word in Hebrew as really the, the word Joshua. Remember Joshua who followed Moses. It means to save or to help, to deliver, to rescue. And so Hosea is this prophet in the 8th century. And his first command is to help by going to marry, enter into a covenant of marriage with this prostitute named Gomer. One scholar said this. It's kind of an understatement. It's hard to find a more shattering first demand in Scripture than was made of Hosea. God rarely suggests something more offensive than this. And if you read through, if you read through, say, Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, who's later than Hosea. If you read through Jeremiah, who's a little bit later. Isaiah is a contemporary. God asks them to do some really crazy things, laying on their side, walking around naked. They do some really crazy things because God tells them to do that to wake up the people. The people are asleep spiritually. God gives prophets like Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah some really strange things to do, some odd things. But what Hosea is called to do is probably the most offensive thing of all the prophets. Go marry a woman who's not going to be faithful to you. Go marry a woman who's going to humiliate you and hurt you and embarrass you. Go marry a prostitute. That's your job as a prophet. Gomer is a woman that Hosea probably before that would not have wanted in his house because people might start talking. Gomer was a woman, if, if she came in the back of Darby this morning, we'd probably all kind of, you know, who's back there, right? Kind of scooch over a little bit, a little uncomfortable. And just, just in case you have, you might have a footnote at the bottom that tries to soften the, the, the picture here. Gomer is not a cultic Baal prostitutes. So in the, in the religion of Baal, the, the, the cultural religion, you'd have temple prostitutes, and that was part of the, the false religion of Baal. She's not one of those because there's a specific word for a cultic prostitute. We'll see that word in a few weeks in chapter 4, verse 14. That's not the word used here. The word used here is prostitute. It's exactly what your Bible should say it is. It's an offensive command. It's not a woman who's just doing this for religious reasons. She's doing this for money. She's a woman who works at night, making money. And so the choice of, of a wife is, is odd, it's offensive, it's unusual. But look at the second thing that, that Hosea has to do, the choice of the names of his children. These names are odd. These are names that would get you beat up in middle school if you went to school with these names, right? Some of you know what I'm talking about. Look at these, these odd names. Hosea has a prostitute as his wife. They have kids. They start a family. And again, this is over years that this happens. Years of shame, humiliation, people talking about him. He has three kids. Let's look at these three odd names. The first child is a son named Jezreel. And we just studied one king, so Jezreel should ring a bell in your brain about what does that mean. Jezreel is a place. Think of Ahab. A couple different thoughts on Jezreel. This is where, before Solomon and David, this is where Saul and Jonathan camped out before they were violently killed. Jezreel. Violent defeat. In 2 Kings 9 and 10, King Jehu, (laughs) read this this afternoon, violently takes the throne and kills everybody. Kills everybody. It's gruesome. It's violent. It's bloodshed. He takes out Jezebel. That's how Ahab's wife, that's kind of a bookend of 1 Kings. Remember Jezebel? Uh, Jehu takes her out at Jezreel. Dead. It's it's awful. Also, in 2 Kings 13, that's where the people of Israel are defeated at Jezreel by the Syrians. They're routed. They're defeated. Everyone dies. There's a slaughter. And so Jezreel as a city, as a place, stands for multiple occurrences of violence, military defeats. I was thinking about how to convey that this morning. It would be like naming your son Vicksburg. If you read the account of Vicksburg, I mean, General Grant is walking over bodies. North and south. I mean, there's nowhere to go. People have died, right? It'd be like naming your son Vicksburg or Gettysburg or naming your son Vietnam. 
people died, just bloodshed, violence. That's, that's not a name that gets you in a career very well, right? Pastor Jezreel. Doesn't, doesn't work. Child number one, the name Jezreel means there was judgment then, there's judgment coming for the people of Israel. And the judgment will come, like I said earlier. It comes in Hosea's lifetime. 722 B.C., the Assyrians come in, and they don't come in with a U.N. delegation. They come in with swords, with bows and arrows, and they kill people. And Israel is no more in 722 B.C. when the Assyrians come in. God says there's there's violence coming. And you might think, well, God's kind of harsh. Well, this is, again, 722 B.C. God's been patient for hundreds of years. He was patient with Solomon. 200 years earlier, God's been patient. He's been sending prophets like Elijah and Elisha, and they haven't repented. So that's child number one, Jezreel, a place of violence and bloodshed. Child number two is a girl. And to be more specific, it's hard to know if this is even Hosea's child. The first child is definitely his. Second child might be his, but the text does not say this is Hosea's child. So it could be uh, Gomer is sleeping around, and this is a son or a, a daughter rather from another person. The girl's name is No Mercy. (laughs) Again, not a great name for a career advancement. Her name is No Mercy or No Pity. It's not a name you'd pick out for for your daughter. And child number two, that, that name is a sign or a symbol that God has given mercy for centuries, like I just mentioned. He was merciful to David when David screwed up, 2 Samuel 11. He was merciful to Solomon. We talked about that months ago. He was merciful to Jeroboam. The Rehoboam called them to repentance. He was merciful even to Ahab. We talked about that six weeks ago. And the people, the people of Israel continued to reject God's mercy. And so God says, now there's no more mercy. There's no more pity. You've been given time. Then the final, final child, the final son, is named not my people. Not my people. In case they didn't get the message on the first two kids, he's saying, you don't belong to me anymore. You don't belong to me. Their continual sin, their continual idolatry, living for the gods of the culture, 8th century culture, demonstrated that they did not belong to the Lord. And specifically what this verse, verses 8 and 9, allude to, alludes back to Moses. This is why I said earlier, this is one of those first examples. Hosea knows the Torah, the, the, the writings of Moses, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And here this is an allusion back to Exodus 3. Remember the burning bush? And Moses, after he, he's running out of excuses to not do what God's asking him to do, to go back to Pharaoh, and, and Moses is saying, okay, who, who's, who's the God that's sending me? And depending on how you translate it, God says, Exodus 3, I am that I am. I've always existed. That's the language here in verses nine, 8 and 9. Essentially what God is saying is, I am not I am to you. That name of I am, I am not that God to you. You don't belong to me anymore. Not because God is angry and upset and just getting even with people. It's because centuries of lacking spiritual fruit in their lives has demonstrated that they do not belong to the Lord. And so child three is a sign that their sin has led them to the place where they are outside of God's people. Their lack of faith has demonstrated their lack of fruitful living. Again, that's on Sunday evenings in James, uh, the letter that James writes. If you have faith, it's going to be demonstrated in good works. One leads to another. If there are not a lot of good works or good deeds, you might need to think through, am I trusting in the Lord? Do I have faith in the Lord? Because if I don't have good works, who am I trusting in? What am I trusting in? And so, in summary, chapter 1, one wife, three children for the prophet Hosea. The wife is a public sign of Israel's lack of faithfulness to God. And the three children are public signs of God's perspective. Judgment's coming, Jezreel. There's no mercy anymore. I've been merciful. And you're not my people, meaning I'm not your king, which means I won't protect you. And that's going to be really important when Sennacherib comes in from Assyria and there's no one to protect you. There are consequences. And so that's that's the text. There's three thoughts, three theological thoughts I want you to think about as we finish this morning from the text. The first thought is this. It's the obvious thought. It's the main point in the text as you read it. The first thought is this. Sin is spiritual adultery. Sin, breaking God's law, breaking His commands, is spiritual adultery. And that was was true in the 8th century. 
BC when the people of Israel were just living for the gods of the culture, uh, which would have been the Baals, the Ashtar, all those kind of things. And it's true for us. If we're not living for the God of the Bible, the triune God, and we're living for the gods of the culture, which in the low country usually means materialism, success, hedonism, or just living for yourself, making yourself number one. Those are, those are the gods that we worship. We don't have Baals as much anymore, or the Ashtar poles that we talked about in 1 Kings, but we do have a mirror, and we do look in the mirror and, and are tempted to think, I'm going to live for that person. I'm going to live for myself. That's sin. And as we think about sin in the 21st century, you might be tempted to think one of two things. One, that sin's not a big deal. If there is a God, he's probably tolerant, and he probably agrees with most of my thoughts and most of my actions. Um, so he's probably okay with it because he's a good God. He's a tolerant God. And that would be wrong. <laughs> not because I think so, but because Scripture says that. Or the other thought you might be tempted to think in our culture is there, sin, sin is something of a bygone era. That, that's, we're, we're past that. We're in the 21st century there. It's my life. I can do whatever I want. I can decide my truth. I can decide my morality, my ethics, my laws for myself. And that, Gary was talking about that in, in 1 John 3, I think it is. Um, sin is lawlessness. That's what John was writing. And so we wanted to be autonomous. That word autonomous means a law unto self. Law unto self. And so you might be tempted to think that I can do whatever I want because I'm in charge. That would be wrong too. Because the Bible is clear about that. There is a God, whether you accept him or not, and he does hold you accountable because he's given you a moral law, the Ten Commandments. Here's how you should live. And says, so Hosea 1 says, if you choose sin, choose to reject what God has told us over biblical obedience, that sin is like cheating on your spouse. It's spiritual adultery. It's choosing to live for yourself and breaking that covenant with God and saying, I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to cheat on God and do whatever I want. Sin is spiritual prostitution. Think about when Hosea was living and he had his kids and people would see him and it was a sign seeing Hosea and his wife and family. So when they would see Hosea at the grocery store, they'd run into Hosea and Mrs. Hosea at Publix. Or they'd be at a soccer game at the soccer fields for youth soccer and they'd see Hosea. Or they'd be at the beach and see Hosea and the kids and and Gomer, that was a visible reminder in the grocery store, at the beach, on the soccer fields, whatever, that they were living a life of spiritual prostitution, the people of Israel were. They were to see that and realize that's who we are, and to be confronted by it so that they might repent. God wasn't just trying to slap them around a little bit. He was saying, here's your sin. You see it at the grocery store when you see Hosea. You see it at the beach or the soccer fields or wherever. You are called to repent. And so Hosea 1, first of all, wakes us up to understand the depth and depravity of sin. Sin isn't just a mistake. It isn't just a bad decision. Sin is serious. It provokes God because it's spiritual adultery, it's spiritual prostitution. And so the first thought is sin is serious to God. He takes it seriously. It is a thing. That's the first thought. First thought. The second point comes in verse 10. Verse 10. After we read verses 1 through 9, you think, man, this is pretty heavy. Uh, this is some heavy stuff on a Sunday morning in Mount Pleasant. In verse 10, we get these words of assurance, words of hope amidst sin in verse 10. And that's the second point, that there, despite sin, there is divine hope, divine forgiveness. That's the second point. Divine hope despite sin. Look at verse 10. There's this reversal of judgment in verse 10 that just comes after, after nine verses of calling the people to repent through the life of Hosea. Verse 10 is this reversal of judgment, or God's going to bring a miracle renewal. He says a family reunion is coming to God's people, despite their sin, despite their idolatry, despite their immorality. Verses 10 and verse 11 gives you a threefold promise fulfilled by Christ. Here are the three promises in verses 10 and verses 11. Number one, the kingdoms will be reunited into one people. Remember, south and north? Now it's going to be one people. The second promise is this. You're not going to have multiple kings in the north and the south. You're not going to have kings being assassinated. It's part of the reason I mentioned that earlier. You're going to have one king, a Davidic king. It takes you back to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7. A promise, the Davidic covenant. And then the third promise is they will possess the land again. They will, they will be in control of the land. And so there's this language here in verse 10 of the sand of the seashore, that the people will grow. There's going to be this reunion. That's an allusion directly back to Genesis. Hosea knows the writings of Moses. It's, a, it's an allusion back to God's promise to Abraham. 
God's promise to Abraham's grandson, Jacob, that they would be like the sand on the seashore. God is saying, I will restore my people. And those first two promises are fulfilled by Christ. The kingdom's reunited. The one leader, the one king, those are fulfilled by Christ. And two writers in the New Testament pick up on this language specifically. Think of Paul in Romans chapter 9. Paul in Romans chapter 9 is talking about the doctrine of election. A difficult doctrine. And Paul says in Romans 9, Those who are not my people, I will call my people. And those that were not beloved, I will call beloved. In the, in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. Directly back to Hosea. Think of 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter writes, Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, no mercy, but now you have received mercy. Directly going back to Hosea chapter 1. That was from 1 Peter chapter 2. So the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter pick up these promises of renewal and restoration from Hosea 1 that is fulfilled by Christ. That even in the midst of sin, even in the midst of falling short of the glory of God, Romans chapter 8, there is the, Romans chapter 3, there is that hope of forgiveness because of the work of Christ. That you will be forgiven, that God can restore you, He will heal you if you repent and put your faith in Him. And don't trust in yourself, but trust in Him. God gives you His Holy Spirit and you find peace, you find life, lasting peace, lasting life. Think of Romans chapter 5. We have peace with God, Paul says. And so that's the second point. In the midst of sin, in the midst of some heavy stuff in in verses 1-9, through there's still the offer of hope, the offer of forgiveness, divine forgiveness from the Lord. Last last week, Monday night, um, Emily and I were down at the Citadel for our ministry to the Cadets Reformed Christian Fellowship. And we're studying through um, Galatians. And we were finishing up, we were looking at uh, the first half of Galatians 3 on Monday night. And we're kind of wrapping it up, and usually I'll say, is there any, any other thoughts or anything you want to cover that we didn't cover? Any questions? Just some time for them to talk about what we've covered. And one of the cadets, he said this, he kind of raised his hand, he said, he said what, what's your favorite Bible story? Now, to be honest with you, I hadn't thought about that. In a long time. And I stopped for a second and I said, I don't know. It's like there's a lot of really good stories in the Bible. I mean, there's a lot of good stories. You think about Noah, it's pretty, pretty good. You think about Jonah, Jonah's story is pretty remarkable. Um, David and Goliath is always popular, right? Um, Elijah's doing a lot of crazy stuff. We talked about that. And then you get to the New Testament, there's the ministry of Christ. He's healing people. He's walking on water. He's raising Lazarus from the grave in John 11. John 11. There's all these great stories. You get in the Acts of the Apostles, and there's all these great stories about Peter doing this, and then Paul doing this, and even the, the things that Paul's touching or healing people. There's all these great stories. So I was thinking about that. You know the one story I did not think of and even consider for a moment as my favorite story? Hosea 1. Never crossed my mind. I've been studying it all week. Never crossed my mind. The story of Hosea taking a prostitute for a wife and then naming his kids these three names was never one story I considered for a moment to tell this cadet. Yeah, Hosea 1, my favorite. I love it. Read it all the time. It's great. Few stories in the Bible are more offensive than the humiliation that Hosea experienced as this prophet, this man of God, took a prostitute home to be his wife, not for a few weeks, but for a lifetime, and then started a family with this woman who probably was unfaithful to him before they were married, and then definitely was, as we'll see in the next few weeks, was unfaithful to him after they were married. Public humiliation, not just for a moment, but really for a lifetime. But as, as offensive and as humiliating as a story of Hosea is, it, it really just foreshadows and prepares you for really the most offensive and outrageous, humiliating story in Scripture, which is the story of redemption. Which is this, that a perfect holy God, an infinite God, comes to you in human form humbled himself to come to you. Think about what Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, taking on the likeness of human flesh. Humbled himself. Christ leaves the eternal glorious presence of God the Father, and he comes to this smelly, dirty little manger in a little town that no one would want to visit called Bethlehem. And then he lives a very obscure life until he's about 30. And then at 30, he begins to heal and to teach and do all these amazing things. And he's publicly challenged and mocked by the religious leaders. He's publicly challenged and mocked by the political leaders in the first century. Not only that, he's then rejected by his closest friends, betrayed by his close friend, 
the chief financial officer of the disciples. He's given a fake trial, a sham trial. He's beaten, tortured, stripped of his clothes, and then slowly, agonizingly crucified in a barbaric manner on a wooden cross, a generic wooden cross between two criminals. There's nothing more offensive, nothing more humbling than that. He humbled himself, Paul says, Philippians 2, even to the point of death, death on the cross. The Son of God. That's offensive. That's more offensive than what Hosea had to experience. That Christ would leave the presence of God the Father and experience that. And he would do it to die for your sins, for my sins. Think about what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8. He says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, for your sake he became poor. So that by his poverty you might become rich, spiritually rich, having everything in God's family, being adopted into his family. Paul says 2 Corinthians 8, he took on, Christ took on poverty and shame and humility so that you could have all the gracious promises of the gospel in your life. He did that for you. As we think about the Hosea story and prepare to receive the sacrament, think about this as we come to the Lord's table. Hosea's marriage and his family are set before God's people as a visible sign for God's people to know His Word so that the people of God would look at Hosea and Gomer and these three awkward kids and have a visible reminder of God's Word to them. That's what the sacrament is. The sacrament is a visible reminder of God's gracious promises to you so that when you take the bread, you consider, think about that, the fact that Christ's body was broken on the cross for your sins. Though he was rich, he became poor. And as we take the juice, it's a visible reminder, not of, a, not of a, a judgment on you, but a judgment on Christ, so that you could think about the fact that his blood was shed for you so that you might be received into his family. It's a visible sign, just like Hosea and his family were so many years ago. Think about that. Consider that, the meaning of the elements, as we come this morning to the Lord's table. Let's pray.